A lot of students have some difficulty in understanding precisely what's going on when they're talking about the power of a hypothesis test and how it relates to type 2 errors. The first thing to understand is that the statistician has no knowledge of what truly is the underlying distribution of the population that's being examined. The only way he or she would know would be to interrogate the entire population and get absolute census information so they know precisely what the population mean is. Instead, what we have is a sample from this population, and we're trying to determine whether it could plausibly have come from a particular null hypothesis. This null hypothesis will likely be based on a theoretical model or on what they believe to be a similar population elsewhere or from a previous large-scale study or experiment. It might be that a statistician is actually hoping that they will find evidence to reject the null hypothesis. For instance, testing whether a new drug is more effective or whether a new treatment or activity increases some biological measure. But even if they are trying to show a significant improvement, it still needs to be measured relative to the null hypothesis. So the overarching question is, does the observed sample mean plausibly conform to a stated null hypothesis? Okay, well, suppose we have a stated null hypothesis that the mean is equal to 20. And the standard deviation is equal to 5. And the sample size is going to be 100. And the alternate hypothesis is that the mean is bigger than 20. So they're looking for a one-tailed significance test alpha level of 5%. So we have a critical value of 1.645 standard errors above the mean sigma over root n. But the point is we don't know what really is going on. We have no idea what truly is going on. So we have a null hypothesis and we know it behaves like this. Sigma over root 10 is going to be 5 over root 100, which is 0.5. So 1.645 times 0.5 is 0.82. So basically, we have a mean of 20 and a critical value here of 1.645 Z value of 20.82. If we have any observation lower than 20.822, then that is certainly a plausible candidate for this null hypothesis. If we have any observation bigger than that, then it is unlikely to have occurred as a natural consequence of H0. Well, how unlikely is it? Well, it would be less than 5%. 5% is the type 1 error, the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when in fact the data did conform to the null hypothesis. 5% of the time we really would get observed sample means out here, but the logic is if it is so unlikely to have occurred as a natural consequence of H0, then it suggests that H0 is probably not the right candidate. So it comes down to does our value lie above or below this critical value relative to the null hypothesis? Ultimately, are we going to have an observed value which is sufficiently unlikely to have occurred as a natural consequence of H0 that it allows us to reject the null hypothesis? Or are we going to have a value which is insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis and therefore we conclude in the absence of anything else that the null hypothesis is plausible? Well, it depends what the underlying real distribution is, which of course we never know. If it turns out that the real distribution was that the mean should actually have been, say, 21, would have a distribution like that. But the rejection criteria was anything less than 20.822. So if I had a value less than 20.822, which means that I would accept the null hypothesis, having failed to reject the null hypothesis, then we'd have concluded that the null hypothesis is plausible 
when in fact it really came from this other distribution. In other words, we will have made the wrong conclusion. The distribution should have been the one for the alternate hypothesis, but we have got an observed sample mean which leads us to not reject the null hypothesis, so we end up accepting the null hypothesis, which was the wrong thing. So this is the probability of a type 2 error. In other words, the probability of wrongly concluding that the null hypothesis applies when in fact it should be some different alternate hypothesis. The power of the test is the likelihood of properly rejecting H0 when the alternate hypothesis applies. In an ideal world, we want the power to be as big as possible. In this particular example, we can see that based on, on these diagrams here, there's something like a 40% chance that I'm going to erroneously end up accepting the null hypothesis when in fact it should have conformed to an alternate hypothesis. If that was 40%, then the power of this test is 60%. So how can we increase the power? Okay, well suppose the sample size remains the same and we have a stated null hypothesis. We're going to have a null hypothesis that the mean should be 10 and we have a particular critical value and suppose that we have an alternate of 12 and a second alternate of 14. Well we're going to end up accepting the null hypothesis if we have a value down here. So if we have anything below this critical value we'd end up failing to reject the null hypothesis, therefore accepting the alternate hypothesis. Now, if it turns out that the true distribution was that the mean should have been 12, then the probability of wrongly ending up accepting H0 is this, which is clearly quite a large amount. On the other hand, if the alternate hypothesis mean moves further away, then instead we'd have a mean of 14. So under this alternate hypothesis, the likelihood that we end up accepting the null hypothesis is just this tiny amount here. So against an alternate hypothesis, the mean equals 12, very large probability of type 2 error and a power which is quite small, kind of 0.6-ish. Whereas if we move the alternate hypothesis further away, then the type 2 error becomes this tiny amount, and the power ends up being virtually the entire curve. In other words, the power of the test is its ability to properly discriminate between the two suggested hypotheses, the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. Clearly, the further away that those hypotheses are apart, the more easy it is to correctly distinguish between them. Suppose, for instance, we were looking at IQ against a null hypothesis of 100, and it turns out that the real population that you're examining uh, has, a, has a mean IQ of 102. What's the likelihood that a sample of any size is going to end up uh, rejecting a null hypothesis of 100? Whereas if it turns out that the, the new population actually has a mean IQ of 130, there's a much higher likelihood that the observed sample mean will be sufficiently far away from uh, 100 to reject the null hypothesis. So moving the alternate hypothesis further away is one sure way to increase the power of a test. The second way is to increase the sample size. Okay, suppose we had, same as before, a null hypothesis against a particular hypothesized mean, 
and suppose 5% top tail, 1.645 standard errors above the mean. So we end up with a critical value here. Any observed value up here would lead us to reject the null hypothesis and say it's implausible that it comes from the suggested hypothesis, therefore we accept the alternate hypothesis. And any observed value down here gives us insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis, so we end up concluding that the null hypothesis is probably correct. However, suppose it turns out that the alternate hypothesized mean is here. The only thing that's different is the mean, the sample size, and the uh, sigma over root n is the same. So this shape will be roughly the same. And we'll end up with wrongly finally accepting H0 this proportion of the time. This is the type 2 error. Now instead, suppose that the sample size was four times as big, so sigma over root n is half the size. That means that if the sample size is larger, then the curve is much tighter. So 1.645 standard deviations would be much closer to the original hypothesized mu under the null hypothesis. So the critical value would be closer to that. Also remember though, that if the sample size is bigger, then the standard error is smaller. So the alternate hypothesis curve will also be tighter. Two things have happened. The original critical value, the cutoff for accepting and rejecting H0, has moved closer to the original hypothesized mean. But also, the tails have become much tighter. So whilst it's closer to the hypothesized mu0, it's further away from the alternate. But not only that, but the curve itself has got tighter. So the probability of ending up finally accepting H0, um, because there's insufficient evidence to reject H0, when in fact the alternate hypothesis applies, in other words, the probability of type 2 error, has shrunk to this tiny, tiny amount. The two ways that you can increase power is to move the alternate hypothesis mean further away, or to increase the sample size. So, to summarise, when we talk about the power of a test, we're really talking about comparing the null hypothesis against a stated specific alternate hypothesis. The power of a test is its ability to properly distinguish between the two hypotheses. In other words, the power of a test is a measure of our confidence that we have come to the right conclusion based on the two hypotheses. Have we correctly accepted the null hypothesis? or have we correctly rejected the null in favour of a particular alternate hypothesis? The two ways we can increase the power of a test are to select an alternate hypothesized mean further away from the null hypothesis mean, or to increase the sample size, thereby tightening both the curves, moving the critical value closer to mu h0 and further away from mu ha, as I've just shown. Not only does this bring the tail for H for HA smaller, but because the curve is tighter, it is much, much smaller. So that absolutely is a really strong way to reduce the type two error and increase the power of a test. Hopefully this makes a little more sense now. Thank you.